Okay, uh, let's get started. Uh, welcome to this uh, URSA's uh, webinar. Uh, today we have uh, Non Sobikili. Uh, he will be talking about when uh, women march in 1929 about women's uh, tax revolt and gender gaps in political participation in Nigeria. Just a little bit, uh, and this is joint work with Belinda from the Barnard College. Just a little bit uh, about Nonso. Uh, he's an economist with research interest in African economic history, economic development, and microeconomics. Uh, his current research includes the long-term effects of the transatlantic slave trade uh, on political and economic development in Africa. And he was formerly a, a lecturer at the State University of New York. And he is a regular contributor to various policy-oriented think tanks in Nigeria. Uh, Nozo, it's it's a pleasure to have you uh, around uh, talking to us. Uh, you know the drill, and the floor is yours. Uh, can you all hear me? Yes. Okay, sorry, my connection seems to be dropping in and out, so uh, I hope that we will to let me know if I drop out. Okay. Uh, thank you for the introduction. Uh, as Manuel said, um, this is joint work with uh, my colleague, Belinda Archibong, who's at Barnard College. And we're all we're trying to look at the, some of the things that matter for political participation, especially when the, as it involves the gender gaps. And just to give a brief overview <coughs> of the entire paper, uh, now, one of the things that's obvious, not just in Nigeria, where I'm based, I'm where the paper is based, but in general, in many countries, is that there are significant gender gaps in political participation. Um, and one of the consequences of this is that gender issues tend to be not at the forefront of policy discussions. Uh, the argument is that policy is less inclusive and is biased away from women's issues simply because women participate less in the political process. Uh, so we wanted to ask some overall questions, like, you know, what are some of the drivers of these gender gaps? And do big events kind of influence participation in the long term? And these big events are important because, as we're seeing now, there's lots of things like rallies, like protests, that try to bring up the issue of uh, political participation in women, try to make it, you know, uh, something that moves to the forefront. Uh, so what, what I want to ask is, do these, big, do these kind of big events make a difference, not just in, at that point in time, uh, but going forward? Now, the, the case I'm going to use is the about women's tax riots in 1929 in Nigeria. And I'll discuss a bit more about that. But that's a classic example in Nigerian history of a big event that, would, that revolved around women's participation in politics over an issue that was relevant to them. Um, in order to measure the experience of that event, we use female incarceration rates to capture the intensity of female involvement. And again, I'll explain why that's important just uh, very soon. And what we find is that there's a positive relationship between being exposed to this historical event on contemporary measures of political participation. And we see these uh, positive effects across different measures of participation, like voting, like support for democracy, and other kinds of uh, community engagement. So that's the broad overview of what this paper is about. Uh, like I said earlier on, gender gaps in participation are not new. Uh, in almost every country, men are more involved in every kind of uh, political action, political activity. Not just in terms of voting and you know, in terms of winning elections, but in things like protests, things like demonstrations, men tend to be more involved. Uh, but these gaps can have significant effects on reducing women's welfare. Uh, if men are participating more, and if men are more involved in the decision-making process or in driving the issues that result in decisions being made, then it's expected that men's issues will come to the forefront, which again comes at the detriment of women's issues. And so we see that there's this bias away from issues that are relevant to women. Uh, now, as this goes on and on over years and decades and centuries, these kind of gender biases and norms can be entrenched in systems, which again can further reinforce uh, this disadvantage towards women's issues and can intensify the gaps between issues that, that uh, are relevant for men's welfare and issues that are relevant for women's welfare. Uh, so the question is, well, how can we start to change that? What can we learn about how that happens and how that, how that changes? And in the context of this paper, 
Can we learn anything from historical events that are around those issues? Uh, in the Nigerian context, uh, one of the biggest events in terms of gender participation and gender political act activity is what we like to call the Women's War, which was a protest uh, in about 1929. And I'll give a bit of background just to you know, set the tone for where that kind of action took place. Uh, Nigeria, of course, uh, as all of you know, is a, was a former British colony. Uh, so this is in the thick of the colonial era when the British are trying to figure out how to raise more taxes to advance their colonial objectives. And one of the things they try to introduce is a system of direct taxation. Now, in many parts of Nigeria, there is no direct taxation system. There are informal systems of taxation, there are informal systems of, of uh, supplying public goods, but there's no, in most parts of the country, there's no formal direct taxation system. And so the British tried to introduce this in, in 1925, and they first start with a tax on adult males. Uh, every adult male had to pay something to the colonial government as a tax to keep living, to put it that way. And now in this period, many male, <coughs> sorry, many males are involved in the process of exporting palm oil or cocoa, especially in the South and granules in the North. And so many males already have a kind of source of monetary income which can be taxed uh, relatively easily and was relatively easy to levy. But in 1929, rumor starts that the authorities want to also tax women as well. Now women in that time are typically more engaged in a bit more informal traditional activities outside the palm oil or cocoa export trade. And so women are a bit less exposed to the colonial cash system. And so rumor starts that uh, the authorities want to tax women. Uh, and then in parts of the country, these movements start to spring up uh, in opposition to this planned tax. Uh, at some point, protests erupt. Uh, people gather in villages and towns to try to protest this rumor tax action. Uh, in response, the authorities respond relatively brutally. People are arrested, shot, killed. Lots of women are incarcerated. Uh, but still, the violence kind of spreads uh, throughout the region. There's lots of violence, lots of looting, lots of uh, violent action against colonial regimes, against the colonial regimes. And in 1930, the women kind of win uh, because the authorities are forced to kind of back down and come up with the statements that they will not levy these direct tax on women. Uh, and some of the authorities, local authorities that were involved in trying to push this tax were also kind of arrested and prosecuted. Uh, and so in history, this is perhaps the biggest example of a case where women led an action politically against an issue that affected women in particular. So now, given this context, the question I want to ask is, did this event in which women participated and won have any kind of future consequences for women's political participation? And specifically, do areas that were exposed to this event, that's this violent, these protests against the indirect tax for women, have different gender gaps in political participation? Now this is 1929, so this is very long ago. Uh, but the literature that kind of suggests that that kind of activity can continue to influence future outcomes. One of that strand of literature is based on the idea of inspirational role models. If you have a grandparent or a grand or a, maybe a person in your town that was active and did a particular thing, then that can influence your own action going forward. One of the big papers on this is by one check on Klajne and Nofta. Nofta, and they find that in Benin, uh, people who are from villages where the first Benoit went to school tended to also have higher uh, educational attainments. And they attribute this to the idea of inspirations. You see someone from your place who achieves this great thing and then you want to be like them and that transmits that action through time. There's also lots of other work on neighborhood effects, uh, such as in the uh, part of the progressive program in Mexico, where it's a program of cash transfers that wasn't given to everybody. But even in towns where people receive cash transfers, other people who don't receive cash transfers get some benefits because they see their neighbors going to school, they see their neighbors doing well, and they want to be like that. 
And so the effects kind of spreads even beyond the people who actually receive the benefits. And so in the paper, I want to ask, are those persistent effects intergenerational? And do we see effects of that action, that women's war action, and gender gaps in political participation today or in contemporary times? Uh, now, specifically, where did the war happen? I mean, I say war, I put war in quotes, but it was an actual war. I mean, only one side had weapons, but you know, it was very violent, lots of shooting and killing. Uh, but it took place all, mostly in the southeast of Nigeria. And what we have here is a map that the colonial authorities drew to kind of cordon off the area where the violence was taking place. And so we have a, a kind of very specific idea of exactly where uh, the protest action was occurring. Uh, and now, one of the things that we also see is that in the Southeast, which I don't know if you can see my cursor, uh, but there's lots of prisons in this area as well. And I'll explain why the prisons are important because we want to use that as a way of measuring who was actually participating in the process, in the protests. So what we do uh, to get who participated is to look at the colonial prison population before and after that event. Uh, so we have, uh, we get data from the colonial blue books from in Nigeria from 1921 to 1935. And the blue books reports the prison population in each year for each of the prisons. So each of the red dots is the prison and it reports the prison population both by male and female for each of the prisons. Uh, and it also reports some other secondary information like the duration of sentences and all that. Uh, but primarily we're focusing on the prison population and the distribution between male and females in the prison population. And just to give an example of what it looks like. So this is the data from Oweri, which is a province within the cordon area where the violence took place. And this is the share of females that are incarcerated through the period. Now the violence starts in 1929, ends in about 1930. All we see <coughs> that the share of females incarcerated spikes in 1929-1930, which we're arguing is, is, is as a result of this big protest that's happening in that region at that time. And because it's a women's protest, more women are just incarcerated relative to men. And so we see a spike uh, in over the prison, which is in the thick of that, of that uh, cordon area. But of course, also in that cordon area, we see the same spike again in 1929-1930, where more women are just incarcerated around that time, relative to men. Uh, Aba is also in the thick of that area. Uh, in Aba, we don't see a spike, but we see a collapse after 1930. Uh, so again, it's kind of gives us the sense that 1930 is when something is happening. And from the historical context, we know that something is happening, that something that's happening in that area are these protests led by women for a women's issue. Now, if we move to another part of the country, which is the south, in the Southwest, which is Ibadan, which is way outside the colon area, using the same data, we don't see the same kind of action. Right? We don't see the same kind of, of uh, effects. There is a very, very small spike in 1930 in Ibadan, uh, which could be due to any other thing. Uh, but we don't see the same kind of effect as we see in some of the prisons in that cordon area. And again, if we move to Kaduna, which is in the north of the country, <clears throat> which again is way outside the cordon area, same data, we don't see that same spike. Uh, in uh, the share of females incarcerated. Uh, so what is, all this means is that we're arguing that our prison, our prison data is kind of capturing who is involved or which areas are involved in that uh, protest action. Uh, now to, to, con to kind of link that to contemporary outcomes in terms of political participation, we use data from the Afrobarometer survey. Uh, the data collects lots of variables on political engagement. Uh, it collects variables trying to figure out if people support democracy, if people voted last election, if people participated in a community meeting or election rally or a political demonstration. In terms of gender attitudes, it collects questions around the support for women's rights uh, and the support for the idea that women should have the same chance as to be elected in political office as men. So on the one hand, it's collecting variables that look at uh, people's supposed action, and the other hand, for example, that, that, that look at people's perceptions about what they, what, you know, they think should be happening. 
and we break this data. I mean, this data is collected by individual. So we have individuals of different ages. Uh, we break this into cohorts because we want to kind of capture generations uh, of people. And so we have a first cohort, which is the oldest cohort, people born between 1912 and 1932, people who have been alive during this uh, event. Very few of them, of course, uh, but still. Uh, second cohort is between 1933 and 1953. I want to capture people who were born or came into, were born after the events, but before the independence movements start to occur. And then we have people born between 1953 and 1969, which is the take of the Civil War period, and then people between 1970 and 1990, which is most of the rest are adults. Uh, so what do we do? We want to do a simple kind of a regression of, on the one hand, the exposure to these events, these historical events, and on the other hand, our political uh, outcome. And so as I mentioned earlier, we have the protest exposure, which is averaged over the 1920-1930 period, because we don't want to look at just 19, 1929, uh, because we can see from data that there is a lot of activity around that time. So we want to capture what's going on around that time. And we look at prisoners, number of female prisoners, about 100,000 people in a province. Uh, now, the key parameter of interest that we care about is this. Uh, I always forget how to say the Greek letters. Uh, but this variable that is uh, uh, the coefficient on the protest exposure and the interaction of that with females. Because again, we're looking at the female action for a female issue. And we have lots of outcomes from the Afro parameter that I will go through uh, in a moment. Uh, so first, our first level regressions look at the impact of exposure to those protests and participation in democracy, participation in voting, and in just general community participation. Uh, and again, these are the variables of interest, the court exposure for females. Uh, now, what we see is that for young, for the younger generation, from some of the younger generations, we see some impacts. People who are more exposed to those protests tend to participate more in the community activities. Not so much for voting, not so much for democracy, uh, but community participation seems to be quite a bit relevant. Uh, we see some of the same kind of effects, again, for the younger cohorts. Uh, for example, uh, in terms of the propensity to raise an issue uh, in the community, we see younger cohorts in areas that are more exposed are a bit more likely to raise an issue uh, in the community. Not so much for demonstration directly and not so much for, I mean, for education, there's a small, there's an effect here, but it doesn't seem consistent. Uh, and in terms of the attitudes towards uh, equal rights, um, I'm sorry, I'm trying to figure out the difference between the two the two columns. Uh, in terms of attitudes towards uh, equal rights, if most people believe that women are more equal than men. We don't see that much difference between places that are actively exposed to the, pro to the protests, but places that are not, and this is true across cohorts. Uh, and in terms of the attitude towards women leadership, that is if uh, people believe that women should have the same opportunity as men, we see some small effects again for the younger generation, people who are exposed to those protests. Uh, uh, but again, not for the older generations. Uh, now, one of the things that pops up from looking at the cohorts is that most of the effects that we are finding so far tend to be focused on the younger generation. Uh, one of the reasons that we think this might be important is because there might be some silent issues which are kind of responsible for people's persons to participate in political protests. If you think of the event itself in 1929 as just 
uh, one of the more outcome variable from these salient issues. Uh, that is important to kind of think about that. So one of the things we should plan to do, which we haven't done yet, is to look at the effects within ethnic groups. Uh, if and the results we are finding simply because of different uh, gender norms, different ethnicity-based gender norms, or only because of the event itself. So once we incorporate more information from the ethnographic atlas and other, you know, uh, other sources that kind of measure gender norms into our estimates. Uh, secondly, uh, and this is what we've been doing in the past few you know, days or weeks, we have a very detailed map of the events within the current area, and there are different kind of events that occur in that area. In some places, people are actually shot on, uh, places with the triangle, people are actually fired on with submachine guns. In some other places, factories are looted, in some other places, cuts are burned. And so there are kind of different actions going on within the current, current area. So I want to kind of exploit that to kind of understand what's going on within the people in that same space who have the same gender norms and have the same relative background. So I want to do two things. Uh, we want to look at the first the kind of regression discontinuity. I want to look at people outside the current area versus people inside the current area uh, to see if there are differences. Uh, again, because we know the current area is kind of arbitrarily drawn by the British to kind of just fence in uh, those who are protesting. And then again, like I said, I want to look at the different effects of different kinds of responses to the protests uh, and if that has different impacts. There's reason to believe that if you're shot at, you might respond differently than if you are arrested or if you loot the store. So I want to exploit those differences in the kinds of uh, action that took place. Uh, so overall, what we are seeing so far, we are seeing some uh, evidence of some persistent effects of being exposed to that protest on some measures of uh, women's political participation today. Uh, we find that for those that we see, So uh, let's see uh, whether it's me or Nozu uh, who froze. Um, can you guys hear me? Yes, yes, we can. Okay, so let, so he froze then. Uh, he told me before that there was a, a thunderstorm in Nigeria. So oh, I think he's back. Okay, Nozu, uh, please continue. Yeah, sorry about that. No uh, worries. There's a power issue here because of the heavy rains. So I think I lost connection for a second, for a while. Uh, but where did I stop? Sorry, where did you stop? Uh, okay. uh, one more. If you can, if you can go forward, yes, you are there. Okay, I was here. <clears throat> okay, so I don't know. Some of the future work we want to do is to kind of exploit the different, the special discontinuity design uh, in this map. We can see there are some people who will fall outside the current area, and some who are in. So I want to see, do we find difference between people who are just outside the area versus people who are inside the area? And of course, exploit the distance to the boundary itself. Secondly, there are different kinds of actions that take place within that area. In some places, people are shot at. In some places, people are arrested. Some places actually destroy courts and destroy uh, uh, European factories. So there's different kinds of action taking place even within the cordon area. So I want to exploit that as well to see if there are differences between the kind of action taken and the contemporary outcomes. Uh, so in general, and just to conclude, um, we find some evidence of uh, persistent interracial effects of being exposed to that action on contemporary measures of political participation. Where we find some of these effects, they tend to be positive. If you're more exposed, you tend to uh, participate more. Uh, in uh, contemporary political issues. And so we think these results kind of shed light on how some of these kind of big events can transmit through time and through generations. 
uh, but a lot of work to be done to kind of further in, uncover those drivers uh, uh, and to kind of further understand some of the long-term impacts of these kind of big events. Uh, thank you. No, thank you. Uh, thanks, uh, thanks, uh, Nozo. So uh, we have time for questions. Uh, do you guys would like to 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 ask questions or to to comment on, on the paper, please? Okay, I can can I can I start? I have I have some comments, Nozo. Um, so there, there is a there is a paper by Melissa Dell uh, in Econometrica which she, actually she uses Peruvian data uh, during the, the colonial period. And she, uh, she uses uh, regression discontinuity. So I, th I think that's a nice paper for you to take a look if you haven't done so, uh, because I think it can give you more and more ideas which will give uh, some nuance, more nuance to your paper. So that, that's one comment. Um, and also uh, it, it wasn't clear if you are actually using the, it seems to me that you have panel variation there, right? You have different uh, waves or cohorts or no. Do, do you have panel variation in there? And the, yes, we do. And are you, are you exploring the panel variation? Well, not really, uh, because from the colonial data, we have kind of an indicator if you're exposed or not. Right, so the prison data doesn't, uh, I mean, it, it varies in the colonial period, uh, but if we're, if we're comparing that to contemporary data, it kind of doesn't vary. So we have only, in a sense, in a sense uh, an indicator of if you are exposed to the events or not. Uh, okay. So we're not really using panel data in that context. Okay, and, and do you know, um, whether those uh, those women they were coming because you kind of touched upon uh, different ethnicities, uh, but do you know whether they they were living in rural or urban areas? Um, so at this time, it's mostly rural areas because at this at this point in time, the population rate is very very low. Uh, and we know. I mean, I'm just trying to just pull up the map. Sorry. <laughs> Right, we know many of these towns that are located are villages, small villages. Mm -hmm. There are some big towns like Oweri or Abada that are relatively big, but the protest movement spreads across just uh, across the entire area. Uh, so it's not just an urban thing; uh, it's a regional thing. Okay, okay, and and uh, and I think I think another interesting thing to do, if possible. Uh, do you actually know if those villages, for instance, that you are showing us right now, uh, are those the ethnicities uh, living in those places? Were they exposed to some sort of pre-colonial institutions? Uh, uh, did they have some pre-colonial institutions before colonialism? Uh, yes, I mean definitely. Okay. Uh, one of the things which I didn't mention, I mean, which we have in the in the draft of the paper so far, is the way in which the information about the tax spread. Uh, so it starts in a town, and there's a rumor that women want to be taxed, and then this, there's this colonial official who really starts to try to, you know, take advantage of that to extract revenue from some of the women. And now in many villages in these areas, they have these women's associations that deal with markets. Uh, and so that association is kind of what takes the message of a potential tax and spreads it from village to village to village. So the institutional structures both within the village, but also in terms of communication with village across villages. And that's how the kind of information about the, the protest spread. Right? So it's not a completely spontaneous institutional building events. There are any kind of substructures that are there that help in transmitting the news about the potential tax. So there is, there is some, um, with the last one, and then let's open for, 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 for questions from other people again. So there is a role of, uh, of of the chiefs, let's say, also because there is this whole literature on the on the importance of pre-colonial institutions and how, especially the British, how they how they uh, coordinated, let's say, with the local chiefs uh, taxation and provision of public goods. Um, and I think that would also, for a, maybe for a future paper, I think that would be a, a great thing to do. 
So that's very interesting. And that's one of the reasons why we are studying this area in particular, because in this region, there are no chiefs. Uh, so the British have tried to institute, you know, uh, district officers and uh, uh, other kinds of authority, but people don't respect that because the, the region has uh, is a bit more egalitarian or republican. There's no unilateral monarchy or you know sole authority that can dictate everybody. Mm. And so the British now have to try to interact directly with people in terms of tax collection, and that's kind of what sparks this whole uh, revolt. Okay. Right. So I mean, yeah. Uh, one of the things we're trying to do is to try to expand our panel data uh, to other areas that have chiefs. Uh, but I mean, we haven't done that yet, and we might not find, you know, the, the adequate data set. Uh, but we're thinking, of, we're looking actively into doing that. That would be very nice. That would be very informative. I think if you if you manage to get data for that, it would be very nice. Uh, question, uh, questions, folks. Hi, sorry. Uh, can I just ask a question? speaking. I just want to ask them the information dissemination. Did you perhaps look at uh, the role of religious societies in uh, disseminating information? Uh, we did not look at the role of religious societies in general. Uh, we can try to no. incorporate that in some way. Uh, we have maps of churches in the region uh, at that time. Uh, and so, yeah, we can definitely try to incorporate that to see if there are any effects of being uh, of religious interaction uh, on this kind of dissemination of information, and if that kind of influences the impact of the events going forward. So that's something we can definitely look at. I think you might be muted again. Okay. Or comments? So I, I have another another question or comment. Uh, because at some point you also um, um, you mentioned that women, uh, which is plausible, uh, women at the time they were already in more uh, traditional. Uh, they were already they already had more traditional roles. Um, would that have any effect on how they would see uh, the role of democracy later on in time or how their descendants uh, would see the role of democracy, for instance, which is a kind of, uh, as such, would be a sort of uh, exogenous view of democracy, or let's say the British view of democracy? Uh, well, it's possible. It's a bit difficult to examine in this uh, current area because in this area, people of the same ethnicity tend to have the same institutional background. Uh, but it's something that can be tested in future work uh, across ethnicities. Uh, I think it's very interesting. Um, I mean, in this area, the palm oil trade is explodes, you know, in the decades before this event. And the palm oil trade is kind of very male dominated. And because it's for exports, uh, there's a lot of cash inflow, uh, there's a lot of physical currency that goes with that. Uh, but for women, they are still more involved in the non-palm oil domestic economy. There is a bit more, uh, less, uh, less cash intensity, put it that way, right? And so whereas I think the males were much more likely to be able to cooperate in terms of just paying the tax and getting on with it, it was a much more difficult issue for the females who would have to first, you know, start transacting in cash and then start to remit taxes because the taxes are paid in cash, in uh, currency, not in anything else. 
And so that's, a, that's probably one reason why you might find you might have seen protest diffusion. But again, it's worth exploring in more detail. Uh, and but for that, I think we need to expand the the scope beyond this area. Yeah. Yeah. And do you worry about uh, endogeneity at all? Because some economists, they will be asking you that question, right? Um, because of this or because of that or because of reverse causality or because of uh, uh, omitted variables, uh, measurement error, they will be, people will be asking you about endogeneity. Do you worry about that? Uh, yes, we do. And especially the omitted variable bias problem. I mean, in terms of reverse causality, I don't think anyone can go back in time. Uh, to participate in the protest, right? Uh, but it's definitely potential for some salient issues that influence both the protest action in this period and that still continues to transmit to uh, current political action. Uh, that's our motivation for trying to do the regression discontinuity. Uh, again, because if everybody in this area is exposed to the same institutions uh, or the same social norms, uh, then it means that you know, unless this map is not arbitrary, then people within and outside this uh, boundary uh, is probably as a result of the event that happens. Uh, and again, if we can control for some measures of gender norms uh, across the country, then we. So I think I think Nonzo froze a little bit. Okay, Nonzo, you are back. Yeah, sorry. Uh, so you froze. You froze for 20, 20 seconds. Um, not too much. Okay. All right. So I mean, the difficulty with dealing with this kind of historical data is that we can't kind of do a survey or can't you know go back and try to design a proper uh, uh, test. Uh, so we kind of have to make do with the data that we have and see how we can be creative around that. And so I really try to exploit this map. I think this map can give us a bit of uh, ammunition to kind of challenge that uh, potential omitted variable uh, problem. Uh, questions, comments? I had a question. Go for it. Yeah, yeah on, the, on the model, how did the model, like the model was fit because I was thinking, how was the participation captured as economists? We are a bit interested on how the model, the participation, was it a dummy? And then how was the, how the variables were entered into the model? Because that would have uh, tried to, so what was my why, uh, that question of uh, why, and then how was the participation? Because it comes up to the endogeneity issue that uh, I think was asked. Okay. Um, so on the one hand, we, I mean, the, the Afrobarometer survey is kind of a foundation for contemporary measure, and that's given by individual. As in terms of the outcomes, it's a logistic variable that kind of uh, captures the range of potential outcomes for each of the participation measures. Uh, so that's our Y. So on our X, we average the number of female prisoners per 100,000 in the province in which the individual in contemporary data is located. Uh, and then we interact that with if the individual is female or not, right? Uh, and so for each individual, uh, they are associated with a province that has a measure of the number of female prisoners per thousand in 1920 to 1930. But like, because right. if you show like the map that you show, their prisons are so much in some region, lower southern part of the south of the Nigeria, then the upper part is like what one per province, like pan per region in a big area. Would that one bias the result like too much waiting on the southern part than the upper part? Exactly. And that's a very that's a very good question. Uh, what we typically do, at least we haven't done that yet, but is to try to split the sample uh, between north and south. Because in Nigeria, especially, north and south are kind of very different, just in terms of their exposure to uh uh, the experience of colonialism. Yeah. Uh, and just like I was mentioning to Manuel a bit earlier, in the North, you kind of have the basics of a more centralized state. And so most of the colonial experience runs through traditional institutions to people. In the South, that's very different. And so yes, you're definitely right. We we'll, definitely have to try to look at how to um, distinguish between the varying effects across the country. Uh, I will definitely do that. 
uh, I mean, we think if we focus first on the discontinuity design, that's all isolated in a particular region in which the event is taking place. So if we look at that discontinuity uh, uh, design, uh, then that kind of removes some of these other kind of issues around the national spread or the different experiences in the colonial era. Uh, but you're definitely right. Uh, at the very least, we should have a, a table of results that looks at things maybe just in the south where there are uh, many prisons or at least control for the prison exposure in the province. Yeah, on, uh, and then also I had a question on another area of, uh, you find the data, the panel is like three, you find you disaggregated into the three and then this event. So how did you put the event into these three panels? Because the event happened, you had the data from, I've read other papers, you had the data from uh, 1900 to 38 for the prison side. Then this one you disaggregated before, after, and during. So I didn't get that clearly. How did you, you get the ratio of prisoners on the year that they were all on the panel year? Let's say, I didn't understand how the panel, because it was 193 periods, then how did you get the portion of the prisoners as at that time or at as which time? So I didn't get that very well. Uh, so let me just uh, kind of go back. Uh, am I still there? Okay, I am. Uh, so this this kind of effect is exactly what we're trying to kind of capture, because you know in some provinces in the re in, in that are exposed to that event, the share of female prisoners kind of shoots up around that time. Yeah. Right. So what we do is we average that between 1928 and 1930, just to not to focus on what but to look at the period, uh, and sum that up, average that by province. Yeah. Right. So each province will have one observation of this uh yeah. bump, the share right yeah this share one observation and then that is the one what we use to kind of match them again by location uh to the individuals in the in the afrobarometer survey so each individual in afrobarometer survey is now linked to one province that has a measure of this average bump between and right because i mean we can't we don't we don't know how, to, I don't think we can match panel via panel, right? Because we're not saying that uh, the effect is a time series effect across provinces. We're saying there's this one event that happens. I'm trying to measure that, right? So it's a one event thing in terms of the, the independent variable. Oh yeah, I think it's a good try. But then the third follow-up, just on uh, that there's some region, like you said, in the, this like the map, like where you see there's a spike. There is a place that you said, I think it's Kaduna or other region where the spike was not too much. How did you treat that? Like, yeah, like in this place, and then some, you see when you go to the map, some places does not have like a spike. So did you just use the ratio or uh, where there was some spike then? Just uh, for clarification. Oh, that's, that's exactly what we're doing, right? <clears throat> Based on our exposure measure, the places where there's a spike will be different from the places where there's no spike, right? Mm -hmm. And that's kind of what drives uh, what we're capturing uh, in our in our in our independent variable, yeah. right? Yeah. Uh, so, for example, and just and, and just to point out, if you look at the the shares itself, you can see here there's fifteen percent. Right. Uh, in Potakoti, right, up, it goes up to 10 percent, goes 12 percent. Um, once you go to these areas, it's basically zero, and Kaduna basically uh, less than one percent, right? Uh, so what kind of cap what, what we're trying to do is capture the how well, or I mean, how well is a bad phrase to use? Was capture how efficient or how much the colonial authorities incarcerated women in that period? Oh, I think it's nice, but just the last yeah. one now. Is it possible that somebody can get access to this uh, data for Nigeria if somebody gives you an email? Because I'm interested in like doing a political economy study in that type of analysis. Uh, yes, 
Uh, I would need to ask my co-author who did most of the hard work. Uh, but I mean, the data source is publicly available. The blue books are publicly available in uh, the UK British National Archives, and I think they're all online. Uh, converting it to actual data might be a challenge, but I will, if you email me, I'll get in touch with my co-author, and if she's willing to share it, then that's fine. But I can't commit because you know, it's not just me who did all the work. Yeah, I think I'll give you an email, a short shout if it's possible. Okay, yeah, definitely. I will, I will try to get that done. Sure. There are, is more, more questions or comments? Oh, by the way, before I forget, the, the paper is already available from, uh, from, the, uh, from URSA's website. Um, uh, so you can download the paper, the, the, the working paper version. Uh, and we are also recording this, and uh, this presentation will be available from our YouTube channel, from URSA's YouTube channel. Uh, questions, comments? Okay, then uh, thanks, uh, thanks, Nonsu, uh, for talking, uh, presenting the paper to us, and thank you all uh, for taking part in uh, uh, and for next week. Before I forget, next week we have uh, another webinar with uh, Peter Rosendorf from, uh, from New York University. So thank you, uh, and I see you, hope to see you next week. Thank you. Bye-bye. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you. Thanks.